question that I have to ask you this morning is, what were you like when you were 16 years old? What were you like when you were 16 years old? Think back. Think back. For some of you, it's quite a distance back. You're going to have to think for a little while to get all the way back to 16. But think back to what you were like when you were 16 years old. What mattered to you when you were 16 years old? What was exciting to you when you were 16 years old? In our house, uh, Caleb and Isaiah are just about to turn 16. And I understand McKenna is just about to turn 16 as well. This is kind of that time, right? It's coming up. I was a little worried. I was a little bit worried because with the pandemic, I thought, oh, man, they're not going to be able to get their driver's license when they turn 16, but they are able to go and at least write their G1, G1. I was going to say 365 because that's how old I am. Anyway, so uh, in our house right now, uh, they're prepping for driver's test. Uh, right now, they're trying to survive online school. That's what our 16-year-olds are doing. They're binge-watching Brooklyn Nine-Nine in the office and streaming on Twitch, playing video games. I don't even know uh, what I even just said. I don't know what any of those that words are or what they mean. But what were you doing when you were 16 years old? When I was 16 years old, I spent a lot of time riding my BMX, uh, trying to see if I could learn how to do 360 no-footers. That was what I was doing when I was 16 years old. Interestingly enough, very similar to what my youngest son is doing <laughs> just before he turned 16. And I was very, very excited about getting my driver's license. That was a big deal when I was 16. And probably spent an inordinate amount of time worrying about girls when I was 16. That was kind of a big deal to me then. How were you doing? What were you doing when you were 16? Here's a question I thought of. How embarrassed would you be if you had to introduce your 16-year-old self to all of your current friends? Yeah, yeah, I feel that one. Just let that one sit there for a little while. Uh, the only part that I wouldn't be embarrassed about is that my 16-year-old self had hair. That was, that was exciting. I'd like that part to back. But I'd be pretty embarrassed if I had to introduce all of you to my 16-year-old self. That would be a little rough. So I was thinking about all this because of this week's uh, passage. Uh, this week we are making our way towards Pentecost, sort of like we uh, have been doing for the past few weeks. And uh, so Jesus has been uh, appearing to the disciples. He's been appearing to a bunch of other people like we talked about. Last week, uh, Heather did an amazing job of talking about how Peter and Jesus were able to reconcile after Peter's denial of Jesus. And uh, so that was pretty exciting as well. And then he gets them, uh, so he gets all the disciples together. He's got them all. And then he asks them to meet him on this mountaintop. He says, go to this place, to this mountain, and I will meet you there. And so all the disciples show up, uh, show up, and Jesus essentially gives his kind of last teaching, his last instructions, his last sermon before leaving earth uh, for the final, uh, second time, not final time, second time. And uh, we get his last words in Matthew's gospel, in the account that Matthew writes about Jesus. And he says this, starting in Matthew 28, starting at verse 16. He says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Look. I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. Now, this particular, when it says disciples here, this is likely more than just the 12 disciples. It's the 12 disciples for sure, but there's most likely it's a bunch of the other disciples as well. It's a bunch of other followers of Jesus who were starting to wonder if Jesus really was the Messiah after all. I mean, there's the whole he's come back from the dead thing, so that's really messing with people's minds, right? And so this is this idea. So they worshipped him and some doubted. A lot of scholars think that what they were struggling with is this is the first time where they are worshipping Jesus as the risen Lord as God, as the Messiah, and, and that's kind of what's going on here. Now, this, uh, 
when we talk about the 12 disciples at this particular time, I've talked about this before, but it's, most, it's important that we understand because movies don't do this well. The majority of the disciples were most likely under 20. The average age by this point was probably somewhere around 16 or 17 years old. That's about the average age of the disciples. We know Peter uh, was a little bit older, but the majority of them would have been in their mid to late teens. Now, this passage is called the Great Commission. This passage is called the Great Commission. Jesus tells the disciples what he wants them to do, primarily this group of 12, but all of those who are gathered here, he tells them what he wants them to do when he leaves. He tells a group of 16-year-olds, primarily, what he wants done. The fullest revelation of God that we have, God incarnate, which is a fancy word for God in flesh, puts his God mind to the task and decides that a group of 16-year-olds, that's probably who you want to go and take this life and message of Jesus to the whole world. I don't know about you, but when I was 16 years old, I didn't even get the jobs done that my mom asked me to do around the house, let alone if you have time, can you go and take this message that I have been preaching for the last three years, can you go take that to, you know, all the nations of the world? It shouldn't be a problem. How do you think your 16-year-old self would have responded to this? How do you think your 16-year-old self would have responded? Would you, would you have been like, yeah, no problem, I got this, right? Let me, let me give you some context. Let's put this in perspective a little bit. All right. Now, uh, the evidence is that the God, they ended up taking the gospel message all over the world. I've talked about this a bunch, but they took the gospel message all over the world. One place we know that they took the gospel message was to London, uh, England, but it wasn't England then, so it was Londinium, and it was a Roman city. Now, the disciples are hanging out just outside of Jerusalem, right? Now, now they've moved up to Galilee, and, and they're in Galilee, and Jesus says, I want you to take this message to all the nations... And they go down to Jerusalem uh, for Pente the day of Pentecost that's coming. And then after that, they go about their business. Now, from Jerusalem to Londinium at the time, or to London, uh, is quite a journey for a 16-year-old back when there's, there's no airplane to hop on. There's no bus. There's no train system. There's no cars. You, you've got camel, uh, uh, donkey, uh, ship. These are, excuse me, these are your options, Right? So let me put it in perspective for you what this journey would be like. It would be like if I told you, more importantly, I told your 16-year-old self that I want you to take this message all the way from Barrie to Miami, Florida, and you have to get there walking, and maybe you can use a sailboat, but the sailboat is uh, actually a way more dangerous way to go about it. All right? That's pretty crazy. To put that in perspective, that is almost 4,500 kilometers. 4,500 kilometers. 4,500 kilometers. Not just that, you don't even know where you're going yet. So now, go back in your mind to when you were 16 years old and imagine how you would feel standing there, listening to Jesus tell you that he wants you to go and make disciples of all of the nations and the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem is the furthest you have ever been in your entire life. Like basically your life exists in between Aurelia and Jerusalem and now God says, I want you to take this message to all of the nations of the world. Are you feeling it? you feel it yet? Truth is that most of them eventually died for their belief in Jesus. They, they died for their, their belief that Jesus was who he said he was and did what he said he did. And, and, and the crazy thing is they, they actually succeeded in the task that Jesus left them. And we know that because here we are talking about it, you and I, 2,000 years later. Crazy. Peter and Paul were both executed in Rome, most likely. Andrew 
uh, Andrew was likely crucified in Greece after going as far as all the way up into northern Russia and back down again. Thomas, who gets a bad rap for that whole doubting Thomas thing, right? Thomas eventually ends up being uh, murdered in Syria, martyred in Syria. Matthew ended up going all the way down to Ethiopia but may, and may actually have escaped martyrdom. Uh, we don't know. Bartholomew likely ended up, he made his way all the way over to India and was likely uh, martyred there. Uh, James also ended up in Ethiopia but wasn't as lucky as Matthew and was likely stoned there. And Simon ended up in Persia and ended up being executed for refusing to worship the sun god. And Matthias ended up in Syria where he was likely burned alive. Thanks for coming this morning. Uh, glad that you could join us on that cheery note. Uh, we'll see you next week. No, uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing for me. Is, is these are people. They're real people, just like you and I, with real issues, real struggles, real, real problems, right? And, and they're these 16, 17, 18-year-old kids. And, and, and God gives them this mission, this, this task, and they do it. And they do it even though they end up dying for it. This is one of the reasons why I believe that this story of Jesus rising from the dead is actually true. These people don't generally die for a lie they made up. Not this many of them. And so the question I ask myself is, is how, how were they able to accomplish this? How were they able to do this? How were they able to make something like this even possible? How does this happen? I don't know if I could have done it. I don't know if I could have actually responded the way these guys did when I was 16. I don't think I could have done it when I was 18, 20. So how did they do it? Well, the first thing is the Holy Spirit. You can't ignore that reality. You can't ignore the reality that we are moving our way towards Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, they are filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul reminds us of the power of the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans. He says, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your human bodies also through his spirit that lives in you, this idea that God's spirit lives in us, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us to call on. And we have to remember that. We have to be able to uh, actually cry out to God when we are doing things that seem impossible, things that God has called us to do that seem impossible. We've got to remember that we have one who will hear our prayers, one who will listen to us when we cry out to him. It's so important. And I, and I think that this is very much evidenced in the life of these disciples and, and what they were able to accomplish. And so I, I don't want to dismiss that by any stretch of the imagination, but I was thinking about another little reality to all of this that, that sort of shows up in this passage in Matthew 28, where he tells them to go and make disciples. It's this idea of discipleship. Now, this is something we talk about at Vox Ferry often, but I think it's something that we have to keep reviewing. We've got to keep going back to it. This idea of what discipleship meant in this day and age, in this place, because that word doesn't mean the same thing to us anymore. Jesus had spent three years with these young men. He had been, he had been teaching them and he had been modeling for them all of the things that he was teaching them. They could actually watch him put these things into practice in his life. He was preparing them. Now the problem is that we, we tend to think about disciples as if they're students. This, this is how we work in our world. Our world is based on a Greek mindset. We go back to Socrates, Plato, and this idea of just sitting at the feet of the masters, listening to them teach. And we think about that as far as rabbis are concerned. That, that you went to the, to, the, to the synagogue to be taught by the rabbi. There's a, some truth to that, but that was because that's how they did school. But the disciples that moved up through the various schools and ended up following a rabbi and becoming disciples of a rabbi, those disciples, they, they, felt, they followed that rabbi around nonstop. This wasn't just about learning philosophies or ideas or principles or concepts. It's not what it was. It wasn't like our, it wasn't like our classroom model of how you teach people something. 
You know, there's this blessing that is sort of famous. Uh, Rob Bell made it famous in, in one of his NUMA videos called Dust. And there was this blessing that was like, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Now, there's a bunch of conservative people online who don't like Rob Bell. And recently I realized that there's a bunch of people trying to disprove this. And so, uh, and calling it one of the myths that preachers like to uh, propagate by sort of sharing each other's stories. So uh, I went back to the source because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing that because I don't like doing that. So I went back to the source, and this actually comes from a passage in what's called the Mishnah, which is a collection of rabbinic teachings that was initially sort of this oral, oral law that followed the, the first five books of the Bible, and then they had the Talmud, and then they had the Mishnah. So the Talmud was this like oral kind of collection of laws and... and uh, and belief system, and then the Mishnah was kind of like commentary on all of that. And in uh, Avot uh, 1 verse 4, it says, Let thy house be a meeting house for the wise, and be powdering yourself with the dust of their feet, and drink their words with thirstiness. One other translation says, and be covering yourself with the dust of their feet. So, for all those people spending all the time trying to knock somebody down because that's what they like to do, this, this is actually where this blessing came from. So this was in the Mishnah and it developed into this blessing, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And the idea was that you would follow along with your rabbi so closely that as you walked along the, the roads together, etc., that dust that was being kicked up was on you. It wasn't some some weird supernatural thing like if you're really close to the teacher, their, their dust has superpowers. It wasn't that. It was a blessing that was like, st stick to this person. Stick with them. Live with them. Do life with them. When you became a disciple of a rabbi like this, you followed them everywhere all the time. And you see this in Jesus and his disciples. When he called them, they lived with him 24-7 for the next three years. They ate with him. They slept in the same room as him. They watched as he taught others. They watched as he healed. He sent them out to heal and perform miracles as well. Then they came back. He taught them. And then they lived life with him for three years. They allowed themselves to be covered in the dust from his feet as they walked the dusty streets, the highways, byways of the Middle East and of that, at that time. The idea is you wanted to know everything about your rabbi. You wanted to watch how they did life. You didn't just want to be, you didn't just want to be taught about some rules or taught about some blessings. You wanted to see those things in action. It wasn't enough to just listen to some information being taught to you, spoken at you. You wanted to see your rabbi actually putting all that into practice. So when Jesus talked about, about the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that God would give you in order to perform these miracles, and then he went and performed miracles, you actually saw that in, in action. When Jesus talked about forgiving people and then on the cross, you listen to him say, Father, forgive them. You're like, oh my goodness, like he's actually doing the things that he taught us. That's, that's what it looks like to actually live out all of those teachings. What do they look like living their normal lives, normal days, all that kind of stuff? It wasn't just, it wasn't just memorizing information. That's how we tend to think about this stuff. You know, the Western mindset thinks, thinks about it's like a, a transfer of information. I have information and now I'll transfer that information to you. If this is all that your discipleship is, if this is all your relationship with God is, it's not enough. It has to go beyond just a simple transfer of information. It has to, to get to that point where, where it's being put into practice in your own life and you're watching it being put into practice in the lives of others. Let me put it this way. Um, nowadays, what we do is we ask people, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? There's all sorts of arguments that happen in theological circles around what constitutes belief. What does the word believe mean? What does it mean to believe? What, is this, what does saving faith mean? All these sorts of weird phrases. Do you believe in Jesus? Now, Jesus is our rabbi, right? So think about it in, think about it in terms of the disciples, could you imagine asking, going up to John and saying, hey, John, I, I know you're one of that Jesus, that, that Yeshua, one of his disciples. Do you believe in him? That's a stupid question. Like, he was there. You could touch him, feel him, get cuffed in the back of the head by him. I don't know. 
They, they, they had him make breakfast for him. He washed their feet. He, he, he broke bread with them. He, he, he handed them a cup of wine. They'd seen, of course they believed in Jesus. It wasn't enough to believe in Jesus. They believed in the rabbi. Of course they believed in the rabbi. Who cares if they believed in the rabbi? The question was, were they following their rabbi? Were they actually disciples of that rabbi? The question is not, do we believe in Jesus? The question is not, do we believe in our rabbi? The question is, are we actually following him? Are we actually disciples? John talks about this letter, uh, later in his first letter. He says in 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 1, he says this. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is God's way of dealing uh, with our sins, not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. This is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. This is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. The one who claims I know him while not keeping his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in this person. The love of God is truly perfected in whoever keeps his word. This is how we know we are in him. The one who claims to remain in him ought to live the same way as he lived. You can see the influence of all this stuff that we're talking about in that last line. That last line I think is really key here. That last line, another translation of that line says, whoever says he abides in him, whoever says he lives in him, whoever says he's actually a disciple of Jesus, right? Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way as he walked. Ought to live in the same way as he lived. Not ought to say that they believe the same things he said he believed. Not, not, not ought to be able to recite all of the stuff that he taught. Not ought to be able to prove how smart you are in the Bible. No, ought to walk in the same way as he walked. Ought to be like Jesus in our world moving forward. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, imitate God like dearly loved children. Live your life with love, following the example of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. He was a sacrificial offering that smelled sweet to God. The disciples weren't just students who were trying to learn something from the rabbi. That wasn't enough. That wasn't what they were looking for. The disciples wanted to, to be like him. To live like him, to walk like he walked, to follow those same paths, to, to live out these teachings that they had have been learning in a way that would be in keeping with how Jesus was keeping those things as well. Here's what I got thinking about. Um, The commission that Jesus leaves us with here, this, this great commission that he leaves us with, is one that, that churches struggle with. I struggle with it. I struggle with this. Uh, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to command everything that I have commanded you. I struggle with it because I struggle with the whole concept of evangelism. I grew up in this sort of conservative faith tradition where we were trying to tell people about Jesus all the time. We wanted people to become converts. And then I moved from that faith tradition. I kind of made my way through sort of the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, you know, uh, second wave charismatic movement. Uh, it shows up sometimes in, in leading worship. And then I went out to Bible school. And then I ended up in a seeker-sensitive church. And everything we did was about trying to tell people about Jesus, share the gospel, see people make decisions for Christ. And I feel this aversion now to the idea of evangelism because I, I've seen so much of it become manipulative and coercive. Now, of course, we don't want to be like those angry street preachers that are out there yelling at people about, you know, you got to turn and repent or you're going to burn for all eternity. And, and there's all that kind of stuff. I don't want to be like them, but, but I, I, don't, I don't want to be one of those Christians that always seems like they're trying to trick people into believing in Jesus. Like they're, um, 
They're like evangelistic ninjas who are, who are looking for sneaky ways to fit Jesus into the conversation. And, and you can't even talk to them without them sort of saying some weird phrase. Or, or, or you say, you know, I'm really struggling and not sure about things. And then suddenly they're like, oh, it's an opening. You need Jesus. I, I, don't, I don't want to be like that. Because it doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel authentic. It doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like Jesus. We talk a lot about conversions in church. What makes somebody a convert? Is somebody a convert? Did they, did they accept Jesus as their personal savior? That, that, like I talked about earlier, did they, did they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth? Uh, these kinds of questions end up all of the time in churches. I got thinking about the Billy Graham Crusades. I remember doing, I actually helped with the Billy Graham Crusade. I was one of the people who was at the front after they made the altar call. And if people came forward, we were to pray with them and we were to help them fill out what they called a decision card. And on the decision card, there were four check boxes. You write your name and address and contact information. And then there were four check boxes and you had to choose one. And these were the options. Acceptance of Christ as Savior and Lord. Reaffirmation of faith. Assurance of salvation. Or dedication of life. And once, the, the, once this was done, if they checked the right box, they would be considered to be a convert and those numbers would be counted and then they would be broadcast after the crusade, we had this many decisions for Jesus. We still do that kind of stuff. In our denomination, every year I'm supposed to fill out a form and every year they get mad at me because I don't. And I'm supposed to fill out this form where I'm supposed to tell them how much money we brought in and how many members we have and how many baptisms we've had and how many converts we made. Here's the problem. At Vox we talk about this honest agenda. It's one of the, t- one of the legs of this bigger table that we talk about. That we have an honest agenda. It's not that we don't have an agenda. I have an, we have an agenda. I believe that Jesus is who he said he was. I believe that he did what he said he did. I believe that he came to teach us how to live a rich and full and abundant life. I believe he modeled that for us. And then I believe he died and rose again to make it possible. And that life happens to be an eternal one. And I want people to know that. Because I think Jesus is the only thing that makes sense. I think living life the way he taught us is the only thing that makes sense. Sense, And when we fight that and we live outside of that, we end up hurt and broken and struggling. It's why our mission statement says that we want to invite others to join us as we journey after Jesus. So here's what I got to think about. Jesus in this passage doesn't ask us to make converts. He doesn't ask us to make converts. What he asks us to do is he asks us to make disciples. He says, therefore, go into all the nations or go and make disciples of all the nations. Not go and make converts of all the nations. Not go and try to get them to believe something. But go and make disciples of all the nations. I think that distinction matters. I think that little bit of a change in how we look at it matters. It's go and help people learn how to walk the same way that Jesus walked. Right? Go and help people figure out how to live the same way Jesus taught us to live and then modeled for us. Go and help people realize that Jesus is the source of life. Go and help people figure out how to do that. Then walk with them as they learn how to do that. Because you're also trying to learn how to do that at the same time. Following Jesus isn't just about saying you believe in something. You shouldn't have to tell me what you believe. It should be evident by the way that you live your life. When I see that there's more love and joy, peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, when I see that grow in your life, I'm like, oh, (laughs) I think you might be one of those disciples of Jesus, right? I was thinking about it a couple weeks ago. Tim did an interview about Redwood, and, uh, and they wrote a really nice piece about it, and uh, they asked him why, why. And if you've known Tim and Rhonda for any length of time, 
and you watch this journey that not even just Tim and Rhonda, but so many people from the Vox community and the amount of time and energy and effort that has been put in to serving in this way. For so many years in, you know, not even paid positions, volunteer positions, and, and ended up putting tons of their own money, time, energy, house uh, into it. It's a, it's a reasonable question to ask. <laughs> Why? And it's not because one day Tim heard a statistic about how many people didn't have a place to live. And he thought, oh, that doesn't seem right. I suppose I will dedicate the next decade of my life and all of the money I've managed to save until this point to fix that statistic. No. Because he's a disciple of Jesus. Because this seemed to be the way that Jesus would walk if Jesus was walking this path. And it transformed everything about how he lives and the decisions that he makes, etc. Now, he's not going to be very happy with me. And currently, he's sitting just off camera, probably not pleased that I'm talking about this. But the reality is, that's, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about just stuff that's mental. This, this idea that we've got some concepts in our head. I, I learned a bunch of doctrines. I memorized a bunch of stuff in Bible school. And so now I have this sort of abstract idea. No, no. The kind of transformation that Jesus is talking about here is, is go make disciples. And Tim will be honest and tell you it's not because he's some kind of amazing guy. I happen to think he is, but that, that's not what it's about. It's because it wasn't just him. It was a whole bunch of people who believed the things that Jesus said and were crazy enough to put it into practice in their own lives and they were willing to sacrifice for it. And hundreds of people have found hope and wholeness and housing and love and community and care and some of them even found Jesus in the middle of it all. Because they were disciples of Jesus. Not just students, not people who could regurgitate his teaching, but people who wanted to be just like their rabbi. Discipleship takes relationship. In our denomination, we have this uh, thing called the core training program. It's take the, taken the place of our ordination program. So in our denomination, you become a licensed credentialed worker, and you, that means you're a pastor uh, like uh, Roy and Heather are. And then once you become a credentialed worker, you either have to work on a theological degree or you begin the ordination program, this core training program. And in it, you have to write a paper on discipleship. I'm involved in this program. I don't mark anything except for the discipleship paper. And the only thing that I look for in these people telling me what they believe about discipleship is somewhere along the line I want to see that at the core of what discipleship means is relationship one-on-one -on -one with other people. The story of Redwood and how Redwood came to be and the way that that journey took place is a whole bunch of interconnected relationships of people who are discipleship, disciples of Jesus on a journey with each other. And there have been times in that journey where different ones of us have had to call each other on our lack of faith, have had to call each other on, on our, our decisions that don't seem to be in line with how Jesus would, would think. We've had to disciple each other on this discipleship journey together. It's not about someone who's figured it all out and someone who knows nothing. It's about this journey together. One of the things that I love is in, in, in the early church, this happens in Acts chapter uh, 15, verse 5. The, the church, the, the, the disciples, remember, mostly kids. Now they've gotten a little bit older, a little bit older. Now they're probably in their late 20s, I think Paul's involved. Yeah, they're being about their late 20s by this point. And, and so they're trying to figure out how they're going to do this whole church thing. And uh, one of the problems is, at first, they were all Jewish people who had decided to follow Jesus as their rabbi. But now there's all these people from all over the world because they actually started to do what Jesus told them to do. So now people from all over the world are starting to become disciples of Jesus as well. And a sticky question comes up. They start arguing about whether or not they need to make all of the new disciples who happen to be male and are not circumcised do they, have to make, get, do they have to be circumcised? Now, th this is an important question because if you're trying to do church growth, you know, uh, and every new guy that joins your church 
has to get circumcised, that's going to hamper church growth. That's going to be a problem, right? And so they're having this whole meeting and they, they decide that they're like, okay, I don't know what to do. And so it says here, the apostles and the elders gathered to consider this matter. So a bunch of different churches sent some representatives. They all came to Jerusalem and they had a discussion about what they were going to do, how they were going to figure it out. Even the apostles, even these, these, these early disciples, they're still just trying to figure, they're on a journey together to try to figure it out. There's not really a hierarchy existing here. They're just like, okay, guys, what should we do? How are we going to handle this? What are we going to do? And they gathered it together to consider this manner. It wasn't even about being right or wrong. It was just like, what do you think our rabbi would do, guys? How would Jesus walk this out? How would Jesus walk through this? And much to the delight of the Gentile converts, they decided that they were not going to uh, make them get uh, circumcised, and there was great celebration and rejoicing in the land. Um, this is what it means to be disciples of Jesus. This is what it means to disciple others and to make disciples of all the nations. It means exactly like I said earlier, it means inviting others to join us. It means sharing the message and life of Jesus with people. Not hidden or coercive or manipulative, just like, look, this is something that matters to me, and I think I think it could matter to you too. And then saying, hey, look, you don't have to, you don't have to buy into everything, but come on a journey with me. Live, try living this out. I know you're struggling in your marriage lately. What if instead of like fighting with each other and talking about how you're going to get your needs met, what if instead you, you started to like submit to each other? This idea of mutual submission, what about that? What, if, what about esteeming others better than yourself? What about that? What about learning forgiveness and grace? And what about this, this way of living that has more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more goodness, more gentleness, more self-control? What about these character traits? What if, what if we live those out? Let's see what, how that goes. And then we can help each other. We can work through that together. We can figure out what that looks like together. What if that's what we're talking about here? Helping each other to become like our rabbi, to become... Like Jesus, helping each other to become the people that Jesus would be if Jesus was us. What if, that's, what if that's really what it means to go, to therefore go and make disciples of all the nations. To go and invite all the nations to journey with us as we figure this out. To live these things out on a daily basis. When I see people do that, the world changes for the better. When I see people do that, the world becomes what God intended it to be. Redwood is just one example of a million of these things. And when we get this wrong, when we get this wrong, the church starts talking about being persecuted in a nation like Canada right now because they're being asked to live stream instead of meet in person. That's what happens when people forget what it means to be a disciple and instead focus on things that Jesus never gave a shit about. When we get this right, the world starts to look more and more like Jesus. When we get this right, God's kingdom comes. His will is done on earth as it is in heaven. When we get this wrong, we treat people with condemnation and judgment and anger and hatred. When we get this right, we call people to Jesus. We lift him up and he draws people to himself and we include others in the church. When we get this wrong, we build fences and we become gatekeepers to the kingdom of God. When we're students, we miss the point. When we're disciples, our lives change and we look like our rabbi. And when we go into the world and we make more disciples who look like our rabbi, who are covered in the dust of our rabbi, God's kingdom comes here, now. What a privilege to be a part of that. Let's pray.